All right, welcome everybody to the March 31st Hyperledger TSC call. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, two things you must abide by. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. Uh, yeah, I think everybody else, everybody here knows how, how what the deal is there. So let's get to the announcements. Uh, as always, the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. If you have any, anything that you'd like to add for your project or your lab or anything that's interesting um, for developers, please add that to the wiki page that's linked in the agenda. Uh, the second announcement that we have is the Hyperledger Global Forum is looking still looking for CFPs. Um, the CFP process closes on the 29th of April. Um, so if you have a topic that you'd like to possibly discuss, uh, please go ahead and add that to the um, to the CFP part. Hey, Tracy. Yeah, thanks. Um, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to add to this that we are also looking for uh, PC members for the global forum. Um, and ideally, we'd like to select this pool from people like uh, TSC members. And, you know, I would say very core maintainers. Um, so if anyone in this group is interested uh, we would love to hear from you and we will be uh, reaching out to people as well. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for that and, uh, you know, we will talk to people as well. All right, thanks, Hart. So yes, the call for program committee volunteers coming soon. I guess that means today uh, you've just been called if you're interested. Um, so please reach out, I guess, what to you directly, Hart? Sure. Yeah. If you're a TSC member and you want to be on it, please reach out to me directly. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. Uh, so the last announcement here, Rocket Chat is now archived and Rai has created a rendered version for us for the history. If you are uh, so inclined to go look at the history, it looks really good. Uh, Rai, thank you for putting that together. Thanks. You're, you're all welcome. I will uh, point out that if you have any uh, private messages or anything like that, that you want to get a copy of, now is your, your time to go log in and do that. Um, I plan on replacing the landing page in about a week with a redirect to the, to the wiki page, giving people instructions on how to get on Discord. So if, if there are any DMs that are particularly, you really wanna save, now is the time. All right, thanks, Shai. Uh, any other announcements that any of the people on the call would like to make? No? Okay. Um, well, I will make just a couple of additional things that uh, came up this week. Um, Arno uh, so graciously created a PR for us for the responsibilities for TSC members. If you haven't had a chance to look at that, uh, please do so. Uh, he put the link in, I believe it was the TSC chat. Um, so please have a look and add any additional responsibilities that you think might be missing there or any corrections that, that might come up. Uh, and then the second thing that I will add is that uh, Bobby let me know um, that the Learning Materials Working Group has put together a specific task force to address the uh, question, Dano, that you brought up a few weeks back around documentation um, and putting together some, some sort of guidelines around uh, how we put together documentation for Hyperledger. So that is ongoing. If you would like to participate, I will find the, the link and put that in, uh, in the chat so that you can have, a, uh, have the opportunity to participate in that. Arun? Thanks, Tracy. So I wanted to bring this up for a while now, and I guess I will almost forgot every time. But I will quickly also talk about one of the community activity that's going on. It's related to Hyperledger Challenge. I remember um, that we spoke about this probably a couple of months ago. And that Hyperledger Challenge is in, in next phase right now. So we 
proceeded from the application submission phase or ideation phase. We are now into prototype phase. And so far we received 29 proposals except the China region. And out of which 27 of them are implementing their, their projects. And we need mentors for helping out all those teams. And most of them are will be proposed as a Hyperledger Labs project soon. So there is we are expecting at least most of them to be um, to come come up and then submit that right. And for China region, today was the last day, and we are we are going to re look into how many submissions we have received for from China specifically. But otherwise, we are we are good with that. So we will need help from you, most of you, and many of them are requesting for help. They need help in like working on, let's say, Fabric, or they need help working on Beso, Firefly. So most of those proposals out of 27, they're all using different frameworks and projects within Hyperledger. Please do help in whatever capacity possible or redirect them to your project resources, whoever you think are appropriate. Thank you. All right, thanks, Amir. Any other um, announcements before we move on in the agenda? No, okay. Um, so for the quarterly reports, we have the Besu and the Caliper reports that came in. I did notice that uh, the majority of us have actually reviewed these um, as they've come in, so that's uh, good. I think there um, there was a couple of questions, maybe on the basic one, that haven't yet been addressed. I think just one of them came in just this morning, so I thought maybe we could take a moment and just uh, talk quickly about the um, incentive program. Uh, for the people who are interested in what that is. So Dana, Grace, I don't know which one of you would like to talk through that. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the incentive program. Okay. So <clears throat> the Ethereum Foundation, um, they value multi-client diversity in mainnet. And they've gone to the point where they've decided to put money behind that commitment. Uh, money, probably is the wrong phrase, but they're putting Ethereum behind it. And this is tied hand in hand with um, the upcoming proof of stake transition for the Ethereum mainnet. So there's um, five consensus layer teams and four execution layer teams um, that they are giving, um, they're asking them to operate uh, fully operable mainnet nodes um, of both the, of the consensus layer and the execution layer. And uh, in exchange for, uh, the intent is they're gonna execute those with their client and make sure they interrupt with the other half of the stack. And so there are some that are given for canaries and some that are expected to be at full production grade. And for teams that meet standards that they haven't fully announced yet, most of it's uptime, but it's gonna, move, it's gonna be a moving target throughout the next, I think, four years. For teams that meet those standards, the, the seed um, Ethereum that is used for the proof of stake will be released to that team to do it as they wish. Um, so Hyperledger Basu is unique amongst the teams in that it is a community project, not just one that is fully owned and operated uh, on, on a governance basis of um, a benevolent dictator. The other projects all operate on a benevolent dictator model, but Basu operates on, is required by Hyperledger on a community level. So the incentive program is the structure that the Ethereum Foundation has been working with me in consensus to make sure that the community has access to this incentive and not just one particular um, company that's operating within the space. Now, the structure of the incentive is designed so that those who contribute to mainnet are the ones mostly that benefit from it. Uh, but there's also a very important 20% carve out that goes to Hyperledger and also another 20% that goes to whoever operates the nodes to keep them up and running as an incentive to keep them running. So they, they benefit just from running the nodes as well. And there's a lot of expertise that goes in with it. Um, the, the, initial cons the initial operators for the nodes will be consensus because the skill set for operating these nodes is not widely known, um, but that is not locked into the contract that it has to be consensus. However, the Ethereum Foundation does have, uh, basically it's at their discretion who operates it. So if consensus is a good operator, I really don't see a reason why they would move it off of them. 
So that's basically a high level overview of what the incentive program is and what the agreement that's currently being negotiated um, with the Ethereum Foundation um, Hyperledger um, to make sure that this operates in, and is a, is a community incentive. All right, great overview. Hart, did you have a comment to add? Yeah, so I'm taking point on this from the Hyperledger side and I've got like a full document that's, that's in progress. And if people are interested, we can send it out to the whole TSC once it's finalized. All right, thanks Hart. So hopefully, yeah, Jim. Yeah, just a, just a quick question on the uh, details. Uh, the incentive I heard is to the operators and I heard consensus being one, Ethereum Foundation being one and Hyperledger being one. Uh, am I understanding correctly that by operator, we mean whoever is running the nodes? Just curious how, how Hyperledger is planning to run, um, run these nodes. So Jim, Hyperledger is not running the nodes. So there are, uh, the, the proposal separates the people developing the code and the people running the nodes. Yeah. Uh, even in this case, the, the, there are some overlap, right? Because consensus is mm -hmm. the largest contributor to Besu, and they're also going to be the node operator. Um, but it, the EF is making sure that there are funds allocated for both like, code contributors and uh, node operators. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I'm particularly confused about node operators. There can be uh, random individuals who choose to do that. How? Uh, Maybe this, this is going to too much detail, but. No, no, totally fine. So basically the EF is going to give consensus a contract saying that, you know, you must operate, you know, this many nodes or this many mm -hmm. Ethereum validators with this software configuration, you must achieve these metrics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that part that, I understand. Yeah. But then is, is that applying to Hyperledger as well? Uh, so Hyperledger is not uh, a node manager, right? Hyperledger is a code base. Okay, I see. Um, okay, that's a part I was confused yeah. with. Hyperledger's yeah, so, role is mainly the, develop, the developer. Exactly. Side. Okay. Yeah. So sense. far, Hyperledger has never uh, run a blockchain or actively participated yeah, exactly. in the running of a blockchain. And it would probably take a change to the governing board charter uh, for that to happen. Um, so, so yeah, so that part is, is not directly tied to Hyperledger. Okay. Uh, if Grace is, Grace is on the call, Grace can probably tell you more about the node operation if you're interested. So uh, um, probably can reach out to Grace separately on that. Uh, just want to clarify the, the role uh, on the Hyperledger set. We're saying um, uh, Hyperledger will sort of become the funnel of the uh, incentive for the developers to, to compensate whoever contributed to the BESU, uh, BESU code base, basically. Oh, that's coming from the Ethereum Foundation. Yeah. So we're, okay. the proposal is being written so that the Ethereum Foundation is, yeah, as Dana said, the EF is defining who they think the big contributors are. Um, and we have this all documented uh, how it works, um, but basically uh, the EF is dividing things into two categories. Uh, they're dividing their, taking maintainers that they think have contributed to mainnet and they're calling those mainnet maintainers. And then they're creating another category called patrons, which is their way of basically saying that, you know, these people or these organizations have been long-term contributors, like, you know, very long-term sustained contributors. Uh, and they're rewarding those two classes a little bit differently. Um, you yeah, I think that's, that's plenty clear to me. If, if you don't yeah. care about, yeah. I'll just post my, if, if everybody, I have a, a tech write-up that's like in a first draft version and I can just post it in the, the TSC chat if for everybody that wants to see it. Um, just please note that this is still like, uh, it still needs a lot of work. Um, 
so so don't uh, <laughs> don't spread it too widely and don't uh, don't crucify me for small mistakes. But it should be in the Discord now. Great. Thanks for the background, Hart and Daniel. All right. So with that, uh, hopefully that answers that particular question that was on the uh, project report. Um, is there uh, any open discussion that we should have before we get to the task force discussion? I couldn't come up with any specific TSE business, but if there's something that somebody would like to make sure we discuss this week before we get to the task force, now is the time. Okay, uh, so with that, then I guess we'll get to the task force discussion. Um, so we had to do a bit of a switch up on which task force we were going to focus on this week, given the availability of some of the folks on the call and the uh, desire to move this piece along uh, a little faster than uh, we might otherwise uh, have wanted if we moved it to next week. So um, the Project Families website revamp I created this wiki page last week, which is basically the format that we would expect for any new task force that is brought to the TSC to try and elaborate on what exactly this task force is about. Um, and so um, I think the, the pieces that I wanted to cover from this today uh, are what specifically uh, the task force is intended to accomplish and the deliverables that are um, that are coming from this. So if we kind of scroll down in this document um, to the tasks to be completed in the list of deliverables of work products, um, these are kind of the two things that I wanted to start with before we actually got um, involved in the, the overall discussion so that uh, we were in agreement with what the expectations of this task force are. Um, so tasks to be completed, uh, determine how we will group projects on the Hyperledger website, and then determine the criteria for projects to uh, meet in order to obtain priority for Hyperledger Foundation marketing. I think those are the two tasks um, that are to be completed. Any, any commentary on that or changes to those tasks? All right, I'll assume that we are in agreement. Thank you, Angelo, for at least a thumbs up on that. Um, so then the, the list of deliverables or the work products that I think we're looking to accomplish specifically, uh, website project pages related to the project sections, website main groupings and updates to the project lifecycle documentation to reflect kind of the new criteria um, that we're going to determine for obtaining priority for Hyperledger Foundation marketing. Any other additional deliverables that we should add to this or any changes to this list of deliverables? Dano? Um, so this is, this might be out of scope of this particular task force, but um, I guess the question is how should the deliverables, the uh, particular screen reflect the mission of the Hyperledger project and um, the Hyperledger Foundation and specifically, and um, you know, how, I guess that's, that's my main question is how closely should we align to the, to the mission? And if the this deviates from the mission, should one change or the other, if, if you get, Kind of what I'm saying. Um, so I understand the question. I don't understand the. How constrained uh, are we to the Hyperledger mission? Is it a must solely fit the mission? Or if we see opportunities for growth, should we reach out for those? It's probably a way to phrase it. 
is the the goals of the Hyperledger Foundation a limiter or an or a base to start from? If I might, um, in in my opinion, we're we're open to to all feedback. Um, so, if you see yourself on the task force being limited, or you have a, a proposal of a new way to go, um, don't hold don't don't hold on to it. Like, don't keep secrets. Give us the feedback and uh, let's see what we can do. Okay. Yeah, I would I would assume that uh, if we need to expand the mission, then that's a discussion that we should have. Uh, Daniela? Yeah, I, I echo that. And we have in the past, um, you know, the Hyperledger Foundation of today is very different than the Hyperledger Foundation of 2016. So, yes. All right. Great, thank you, Daniela and Rai, uh, for answering that question for Dano. Um, all right, so any any other additional thoughts on the deliverables or if there's any changes there before we start to get into uh, the straw man proposal that has been put together, at least for, I think the first task, which is how we would group projects on the Hyperledger website. Okay, if there's no additional um, pieces there, then uh, David, I don't know if you wanna walk us through these, this particular proposal or how you'd like to approach this. Sure, I'm happy to speak to it. And just for a little bit of background, this pulls in information from a few different threads of discussion. And I figured it would be helpful to create a visual that you know, incorporate some of these different ideas just so we have something to respond to and as a starting point. So this includes some of the thoughts that came from Hart's Project Families document and includes some of the threads that came out of the Greenhouse Task Force. If people remember from that, Helen's report of that task force said a number of things were surfaced in those discussions around how do we help onboard new people that weren't included in the task force. You know, Helen's recommendation was to have a follow-up task force that you know took forward some of those threads about how do we help new people figure out what's going on in Hyperledger and how to get connected. So that includes some of these those ideas that came out of the Greenhouse Task Force. And then just some of the observations that we've had with our designer about how do we help make things you know easier to find. So for example, people may remember grid, the most recent grid quarterly report mentioned that some of the information around grid was hard to find on the website. And I think some of that is fair feedback. Some things are fairly buried. You need to click three or four times to find something. So we talked to the designer about how do we address some of those things. So a number of different things are pulled together here. So I'll try to just point out uh, a few of the things that are different from the current projects information on the website. And then again, this is a straw man proposal, just uh, intended to be a starting point. Nothing in here is set in stone. So, you know, to what Rai said, if you have ideas or thoughts or feedback, you know, we want to hear it. So please, please feel free to share. So, um, and one other thought, this also pulls some thoughts together from the recent project services document, where again, we were talking about, you know, projects at different levels get different services. So, um, and that launches into one of the first things you may notice currently on the website, all projects are treated equally, but on this mock-up, you can see there's clearly a section where there are a set of projects that are getting priority placement. And then if you scroll down below, further down, you can see that additional projects are given uh, secondary placement. So. That's the first thing. And there's a whole discussion of which projects go where for the sake of this mock-up, I just had our designer take the graduated projects and give them priority placement and the incubation projects under that. I mean, that may or may not be the right way to do it, but you can at least see what it would look like in a design sense to what would, you know, this is how one way we could give some projects priority placement. Um, Another thing, if you scroll up, I mean, I think one of the big downsides of the current landscape is a lot of the information is buried. For example, you don't even see project descriptions until you click into something. So I, I think this is a, an improvement for people who aren't already familiar with what the projects are. You can see, for example, the descriptions here are showing 
you know, I think the landscape is great for people who already know what's going on in uh, Hyperledger. You can see, for example, the Aries logo and you know, already know all about it. But if you don't know <laughs> what that logo is, it's not as helpful. So uh, this is intended to be a richer project description than what's currently on the landscape. So you can see the description is showing there. We could use a set of tags if we wanted to do that around a given project. There's a learn, learn more button that would take you to a full project page. And then there's a resource drop dropdown. Uh, that's not really defined yet in this mockup, but you can imagine that if you had a resources drop down, that could be, for example, documentation to Grizz point, like how do we surface some of that information at a higher level? It could be the repository. It could be, you know, any sorts of things that we want, we could put in that resources drop down. So it's got this richer project placement, uh, a richer project descri description uh, field and then one other thing to point out uh, in the description above, it also has a link to a getting started guide. You know, I think one thing that we've heard from people is I see that you have a lot of projects, but which one is right for me, right? And I don't think we necessarily have a great way for people to figure that out right now. So one thing that we've added in this design is a pointer like, hey, here's some projects, but if you're not quite sure, which one is a good fit, you can go here. So we don't yet have a mock-up for that getting started guide, but that will be a third uh, design deliverable that we can include in this discussion. So like, how would we want to help orient people to a given project that might fit their needs? So that's that's taking a little bit longer than these other two mock-ups, but just a flag for the task force that that's something that I will share when our designer has a chance to get that back to us. But that's a difference than what is currently on the projects page. So those are the three main differences about this mock-up on the projects page and the current projects page. And if you could go to the second uh, mock-up, I'll hey, talk about David, what... David, before we get there, sure. uh, Grace has a question. Oh, um, and I think I have a question as well. Sure. Yeah, um, so I think I've, it, th this is great. Like, first of all, are looking good. I have not been super close to this. So apologies if I am not, uh, if this has been discussed or kind of, uh, as a part of the other work going on. But um, so I, I think it's great to kind of feature different projects and make it a little easier to understand of what they're, uh, what each of them are when we're approaching the website. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. So also like, I'm not sure if this is relevant, but have we considered like framing it almost completely differently? Like of what are we trying to accomplish? Not here projects, have fun, like, but I want to, build a network I want to yeah. do like something like that sorry go ahead absolutely no no that's a good point and again that sort of feedback is certainly welcome and maybe that's a better way to frame it and I and in my mind that's much of what would be in the get it's getting started guide we will be able to basically figure out figure out what path you're on like I'm a developer and I want to do x or I'm a business analyst and I want to learn more about this sort of you know blockchain in this industry right so we don't yeah, have, yeah, as I yeah, mentioned before, sense. we don't have a mock-up for that and we'll get it. And maybe when we get that, we decide maybe that should be the main page and the project stuff should be underneath that. So, uh, I mean, I think that sort of feedback is certainly welcome. Yeah, so maybe a, just a list of projects is not the right entry point, right? Yeah, exa exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that sounds good. And like the game, I was thinking maybe the getting started guide was halfway there, but yeah, I think, you know, for new people, you know, the names mean nothing, right? And and sure, even sure, saying sure, like an Ethereum client means nothing. <laughs> so sure. like, but hey, I want to send transactions. I want to connect to mainnet. I want sure. to I want to do this other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like that. That means maybe something to them. Uh, to like new people who are familiar with that culture. Uh, that sounds good. Piece. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Where it lives like, in the structure is it top level or secondary? I guess we need to sort out. But exactly. Yeah, I think I think that was similar to to my. Uh, point that I wanted to make as well. I think this getting started is, uh, I think there's actually multiple ways to look at this, right? I think what Grace just talked about, I want to do X, right, uh, is, is one way. I think there are people who probably want to look at all the projects and um, make a decision about what they want to do there. I think there's also, um, you know, it's similar to I want to, but it, it's more like the project families that we were talking about earlier, which is what this task force was designed around, um, of, you know, uh, given whatever that higher level thing is that we're trying to create, 
uh, a grouping around, um, you know, looking at it from that perspective as well. So I, I don't think we should be limiting ourselves on the website to one view over another view. I think that all different sorts of views are interesting depending on what the person is that's coming to the website is actually looking for. So, uh, yeah, so, Jim, you're. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Tracy. Um, first of all, I, I like the, the new design of the top page. Um, I wonder if there's a balance between um, giving giving priority to the graduate projects versus doing what we can to help uh, all projects be successful, especially the the ones that need to become graduated. Uh, so now, right now, I see. Uh, I think I like the the, the format where there, there's description text below the icon. Can we apply that to the other projects as well? I think that will help a lot, especially if you are in the lower uh, group. You see all icons again. You don't you don't know what they're doing. If we can put the same treatment to those group, um, that's that's just helping all the projects to to get the intention, uh, get the attention and adoption, uh, so they can they can become graduated one day. Sure, and that's fair. I mean, I think this goes back to the project services discussion where we had to have a balance between incentivizing somebody to go to the, you know, the steps to become graduated, but also not removing so much support from the, you know, from the incubation level that they can't get to that point where they can get graduated. Any other comments on kind of just this first uh, view before David takes us through the, the second view that he uh, has in the strama? Hi, Tracy. Hey, Benjamin. Hi, sorry, just maybe to this uh, point, also for just to make everyone aware is that I've also tasked the website team to look at implementing the Drift app which uh, has been already quite successful on the Linux site. And uh, this will also help uh, massively with the user journey in terms of the previous questions. And can you tell us a bit more what this Drift app is for those of us who are unfamiliar? It's a user journey uh, conversational app where you can uh, talk to the app and say, hey, I'm a new developer looking for X, and the app will respond with specific journeys for specific people, depending on who they are, where they're coming from, what they're looking for, etc. So it's quite sophisticated in terms of ma mapping out uh, journeys uh, specifically to people's needs. And then it will uh, orient orientate them around the website accordingly. That's that's great. I uh, I've seen uh, a new contributor uh, in Discord who's kind of been outreaching to a number of different projects about how do they get involved with that project, um, how do they start working on issues and those sorts of things. So I think something like that could potentially be a, a great benefit for uh, new joiners coming in to to really start to dig in and know where to go. Uh, even outside of, say, the hyperledger.org website, but even to, I want to go to, uh, you know, I'm a JavaScript developer, I'd like to, to find um, things that I can work on in the fabric space, uh, and that taking you directly to, say, GitHub uh, with the, the JavaScript SDK and good first issues, right? Um, I, I think, you know, this is, website. yeah, that's great. That's great. Good news. Awesome. Um, any other uh, comments then before we move on to the, the second mock-up? Okay, so David, if you wouldn't mind taking us through the second mock-up. And the second mock-up is really where we get into the families and the grouping part. And, and, you know, I think this is key, you know, and again, I think this is a downside of the current landscape. You don't, you see these logos kind of floating out there, but it's not clear which ones are related to which. So here, this is 
again, the data is not complete. I just had the designer do a couple of things. Don't take this as, you know, you know, a, a complete page, you know, maybe there's some things missing, but this is just showing you a direction we could go for. Uh, you know, I asked uh, our designer to mock up a, the, a fabric page and you can see on the sidebar, there's a section that says related projects and labs. So if there is a, is a project that's related to it, you can see that all in one place, right? So this is where a grouping could occur. And again, you don't really get that on the landscape. On the landscape itself, it's not, there's no real connection between one thing and another. You can click on fabric in the landscape. And I, I mean, unless I'm um, missing something, it doesn't really, you know, point you to these other places. So um, a grouping could occur here. Uh, um, Another thing on here goes back to the, you know, the pathways and the journey conversation we're having. You, you can see right now on a project specific page, there's no real uh, um, division into content around personas, so to speak. So you can see here in that uh, horizontal bar, there's some content that's grouped by the type of user who may be on the page. So if you're a developer, there's a set of links. If you're, use, if you're a user, there's a different set of links. And if you're a business analyst, there's a different set of links. So I think that might be helpful in helping people self-select into something that's more relevant for them versus where I kind of feel overwhelmed myself going to the landscape. You know, I counted up uh, all the links that were on the landscape and any one click into a page has like 20 something links in it, but it's not really divided. It's really hard to know like, okay, of these 20 links, which one is relevant for me? So, you know, I like that this helps categorize things and helps provide at least some direction for people to self-select. So those are the two main differences here. The, the, the sidebar with the grouping and then, you know, giving the persona Another minor thing, if you scroll up, we did also provide some sections here around tagging. Uh, um, I think the tagging could really be pretty open-ended and this might also help people identify things. So you, you can imagine that could be any sort of thing, right? What, what use cases maybe, or, you know, some technology related uh, um, tags. I mean, it could be, you know, this is, you know, maybe where we could have our current groupings, like it's a tool, it's a DLT, it's a something else, but, you know, we could, I think we have space to do, you know, almost anything with the tags. So. Uh, that's in the design as well, although it doesn't get into the specifics. So those are the main uh, um, design notes on the subpage to point out. All right, thanks, David. So um, the, the the question that I have or the comment that I have is around labs. Um, so when we when we created the the labs charter. Um, the intention was that this was an easy place for people to get involved with very little overhead or um, help from marketing uh, and the, the Hyperledger Foundation staff on, um, on that lab. So I forget exactly how we stated it in the actual proposal, um, but you know the, the idea being if we were to include labs in the sidebar, uh, somebody is going to have to decide which labs get included there. Uh, somebody is going to have to decide which labs are worth including there, uh, because some of them may be more active than others. And uh, and then you've got a, a completely different sort of set of challenges that come with, well, why isn't my lab here um, when this other lab is here or, or that sort of thing. So I, I would um, hesitate to say that labs should be included on this, given the fact that this task force and kind of what we've been trying to focus on is how do we give marketing to the, the uh, projects that have graduated or that are a family of projects that would actually you know, make sense to, to market. So that, I think that's my, my um, uh, comments on, on this particular mock-up. I hear you, and I think those are all valid concerns. You know, we do have a lot of labs, and it's not clear what would be, you know, worth linking to. For example, if a lab hasn't been updated in a year and a half, yeah, maybe we don't link to it. I think that's a fair point. Um, I mean, I guess my counter, you know, counter thought is that we, I've been trying, you know, Ryan, Sean, and I have been trying to support labs for a long time. And one thing we consistently hear is that it's hard when we don't talk about the labs, it's hard 
for a lab maintainer to, you know, find people in the community who are interested in what they're doing because people just don't find out about it, right? It's a, it seems like a bit of a catch-22 and maybe goes to Jim's point about how do we help, you know, the, the efforts in the community grow and, and you, know, um, you know, attract attention. You know, if we don't talk about something and if we, you know, hide the information, it's hard for those, uh, uh, either those incubation projects or those labs to, you know, you know, get connected with people who may be really interested in them. I mean, my thought would be put the lab information on there, but in a clearly secondary point, you know, level below it. And then we can have some clear criteria. Like if you haven't, you know, had an update in your lab and, you know, X many months, what is it, six months, then you're not, you know, going to be listed. And only those projects, only those labs that work with another project, you know, would be on that project page would be my thought. Yeah, I guess there's a, there is a tension there, right? Because what we have heard, um, given the fact that we've created this document that says this is the support that graduated projects get versus incubated projects get versus labs, that there is a tension for the time that you guys are spending on things that are not graduated or incubated, right? Um, and is that the right tension that we want to, to be giving or do we want to be convincing or working with these labs to get them to be an incubated project? And I don't know what the right answer is. I'm just, I'm bringing it up because I think there is a tension and, and we um, you know, need to understand what our goals actually are. Are they to um, market graduated projects? Are they to market a, project family, are they to market labs, um, right? Like, I, th I think that's the, the challenge that we have and probably why this task force exists is, is partially because of that. Agreed, yeah, and that's why, yeah, exactly. There is a tension and what's the right balance? I think we don't know. And that's why the, the, this, is, this mock up is just a straw man, you know, and it, it's raising questions like that. So I think this is helpful and yet yeah, we're not, we're not fixed on any one outcome just because this is where the starting point is. Any comments on this particular project page kind of format uh, from other folks? Angela? Yeah, th thank you, Tracy. So, and sorry for my voice. Unfortunately, I have a, a cold. But I, I must admit, uh, I, I would, this time I, I tend to agree with what you just said, Tracy. And even the last time I, I was also supportive for the labs. But uh, uh, what you said, it, uh, it's clear to me that the messaging, uh, if we have also labs, uh, might be less clear or a bit confusing, especially if a, a lab is still in a, at early stages, what it means that what does it mean that it appears there, and um, also the order? Then, what what how do we decide the orders? So do we leave? Uh, I was also thinking maybe the maintainers of the the project can, in this case, then we have fabric here. Fabric maintainers can decide what to highlight on this sidebar as well. But I tend to agree with you this time that uh, yeah, the, I mean we have to focus on the project that can that can deliver. They have uh, support from the clear support from the community, diversity. They may they meet certain criteria, and the message will become much clearer. Overall, I think I like the graphics. Let me say that I, I like these overall graphics, and it's it's really nice. Well, good job. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Angela. And rest the uh, rest the voice and get better. Uh, Peter? I just wanted to chime in on that as well. Uh, I like the designs and on the attention or lab versus everything else. I would say if I put on my user hat, as in I have a problem that I'm trying to solve the software and I just arrived on hyperledger.org, then anything that I see there, I would assume that it's not something that's in beta or alpha or an incubation or anything else less than it being ready for me to be used as of right now. And so because of that, my opinion would be that we should provide 
access to the lab's information, but it should not be maybe front and center right next to everything else because it could create confusion. I mean, in my opinion, it will create confusion because if I don't know anything about Hyperledger, I'm just new and coming in and looking for a solution to my problem, then I won't be aware that the labs exist and uh, in other sort of organizations similar to Hyperledger where I've seen what is front and center is always what's available that the people in there think should be used as of right now in, in production. And uh, yeah, so I would, I would assume if I was this user that that is the case and that if I am presented with labs, and then I go down the rabbit hole of trying one of them out and then realize that this may never actually come out of the lab. May, there may not be maintainers or any of that, but you're still two for projects, but it's a lower probability, hopefully. Uh, then I would be slightly disappointed that this was put right in front of me on the main page. Um, that's it. All right, thank you, Peter. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the personas right, are important here, right? Because that's talking from a user perspective. If you're, say, um, like the the chat that I saw where, and I think it was in the welcome, where somebody was saying, like, they're coming in as a graduate student and they're looking to try and put together, um, you know, some research or some projects or, or that sort of thing. Um, you know, I think they might be interested in digging into labs. Uh, so I, I do think that we we really need to understand who the person is as we design the website. And, uh, you know, maybe this Drift app is, is a good way of kind of focusing people where they need to go. But I, I do think, Peter, that you've you've kind of hit the, the nail on the head, if you will, right, where for a particular persona, right, they're not going to want to see labs um, for another persona, maybe they do. Uh, and so I think we need to, to take and take that into consideration as we're designing these as well. Daniel? So this kind of goes along with the observation that, um, that uh, Peter had. Um, I think, and this kind of alludes to what I was, was asking earlier, I think what we're starting to see and what we'll continue to see is the nature of the personas coming to Hyperledger is changing. And probably the best way to describe this is when people come out and say they want to build a web app today, they don't first decide whether they're using Apache or ISS or Nginx or Tomcat. Um, they look at higher level questions about, you know, are they going on a single page app? Are they going on a multi-page app? Um, you know, what, what front end tools, what's the, what's the web app going to accomplish before they talk about the more infrastructural things. And, you know, five years ago, that was the number one question was, you know, what's the base level, level DLT because that enabled everything else. But I think we've reached a maturity in the ecosystem where there's, you know, increasing portability between these, where you ask the question of, well, I want to build a token. I want to build an NFT market. I want to build a CBDC. I want to build, um, you know, all the other things we might go through. I want to build some supply chain stuff. So when people come and they say they need a blockchain app, that's usually where they start thinking of, they don't start thinking of, well, I need fabric, well, I need sawtooth, well, I need Ethereum, EVM, I need a public network. They might ask things like, I need a public network, we need a private network. But my concern is if we build this where the specific um, base layer DLT is put first, um, we're not enabling the audiences that are coming to us and that are gonna be coming to us and enabling them in a way that they work. Now we need these DLTs in Hyperledger. These, these are table stakes, we absolutely must have them. But, you know, and that extends to other things that I've seen in the, in the permissionless blockchain world is that can also lead to tribalism, which makes it hard for teams to work together when you focus on the individual blockchains themselves rather than focusing on what people are going to build on them. So that's, you know, this is probably out of scope of this particular website, but I think we should enable it in mind so that if we do transition to that, that, you know, we have different families that aren't necessarily focused. We might have an integration family where we focus on these projects. And that's my concern of putting a project as the lead in a group and describing the group in context of that project. So that's 
one of one of my concerns, but I'm not convinced there's a better solution out there. So this might be the best solution and we'll just have to keep our eyes on that concern too. Thanks, Tana. The, uh, in response to that, if I may, uh, I think that the Drift app, uh, we, can, we can build those kind, kinds of journeys when those kind of questions are asked. And that's something that would be really helpful to, to get your feedback on. All right, so I have a, I have a question. Uh, we're, we're about, let's call it five minutes out uh, from the end of the call. I, I feel like uh, some of this is helping, some of this discussion is helping us with determining how we will group projects on the Hyperledger website. Uh, I don't think we've necessarily gotten to any sort of uh, conversation around determining criteria for the projects to meet in order to obtain priority for Hyperledger Foundation marketing, although we've done a bit of discussion just high level on that um, particular topic. Um, as far as next steps for this task force and things that we can do in an offline manner um, before we meet again, um, I'm wondering if we should uh, spend some time to focus in on kind of the priority for how we uh, determine kind of what the projects are that, that get that priority. Any thoughts on kind of how we would approach that or if that's the right next step? Yeah, I think there's some, I put some comments on that in the project families document. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, community metrics are a great way to look at that. Um, but, you know, obviously picking out those community metrics, I think is, is you know, the devil is in the details of that one. And is that, is that new or that's, that's information that was already in that project families document? Part? It was already there. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, I think maybe we need to uh, see if we can take a look at that project families document uh, that Hart had put together. It's linked in, in the references at the bottom of the project families task page and um, maybe fix up this document to reflect kind of what it is that we're, we want to do around, um, around the project families. I think the other kind of tasks that I could see coming out of today's discussion is just the, um, you know, is, is there somebody who wants to put together a list of um, maybe those I want to's or I'm this sort of persona looking for X uh, coming into the website? Grace? I'm not the right person. I'm not wrong for that, but I think what you're asking for, I, I mean, if we're going to do this right, we probably need like a user researcher and like a professional, like to kind of go through the different personas, identify the personas and then be like, what's important to them. And then, and then be able to create that list you're asking for. So maybe the ask is, do we want a, yeah. Do we want to hire outsource user researcher to go through the, um, different personas of people who are entering our site and, and, and then go from there. Or that's one option, sorry. Yeah, and Benjamin, I don't know, it sounds like maybe you've already tasked some folks with doing that sort of thing, is that correct? Is What is there that we could do to help with that? I've only tasked the integration of the Drift app so far. So uh, this, the second task will, will be to start building out the journeys and the, the questions. And also I'm finishing the personas to assist with that. Jim? Yeah, just another random uh, idea. I think we also need to define a list of um, uh, functional groups uh, that multiple projects will fit in uh, if they can be used to as a prominent label. I think uh, David's design has a provision for that already. Uh, he calls them tech names. 
um, feel like those can be really useful for people when they look at the project names to sort of just have the first level understanding what they do. Well, it's just looking at the club native, they've got hundreds of projects and this is very effective uh, when, when they list all of, them, all of them in the grid, they just add a simple label of, of functionally what they do. Container runtime, that's very easy to understand, for example. And uh, Jim, did you want to take a, a first stab at that? Uh, because the yeah. things that come to my mind, I think are the ones that we have, which probably aren't enough. Uh, and so, yeah, if you wouldn't mind taking a first stab at that, I think that'd be great. Can that, yeah, we'd love to help. Okay, great. Is there an issue uh, that this is gonna be done in? Uh, so we're just doing it on the wiki page itself. Okay. Um, so you can either create like a sub page to that um, to capture that information or, or um, okay. it's probably best to do okay. a sub page. Otherwise that main page is gonna get really unwieldy. Okay, any other comments before we close for today? All right, uh, if there's no other comments, then thanks all for attending. And I think next week our uh, task force that we'll be covering is the one that we were originally scheduled to, to cover today. Um, and that is uh, the one, Dano, I think you're gonna lead us through. Yeah, I'll even have some docs in the chat room on Monday for the scoping. And uh, I think our first meeting is just gonna be a brainstorming exercise. And that's uh, the project gaps. So what projects are we missing within Hyperledger? Yep. All right. Well, we will see you then all next week. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Bye. Thanks.